All right. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. No, I'm live right now, Jim. I love you, buddy. Watch me. Sorry, I'm just talking to somebody. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Are you shocked, Gavin Hill? Are you shocked? Shocked? Sorry. Sorry, guys. I just started live stream. And today is, what's the date today? September 19. So it's a live stream. So I guess I'm live streaming as James White on his dividing line is talking about me. Are you guys shocked? Isn't this confirmation what I said about him? That he uses his dividing line as a bully pulpit to attack people, to mock people, ridicule people, to try to intimidate them and scare them and <clears throat> alienate them and vilify them? Are you guys shocked? Are you guys shocked? I mean, the dividing line has become a joke, hasn't it? I don't know when the last time I've been able to sit and listen through a dividing line. Yeah, <sighs> boy. Are you shocked? I don't want to make this about him because he's not worth it. He's not worth the time that I rob you guys of to talk about him. Come debate night by the power of the triune God. As the Holy Spirit fills me and helps me to crucify my flesh and walk in the life of the Spirit. To be filled with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I promise you, come debate night. I will do to him what no one has done to him before. Okay, so just leave it at that by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask the Holy Spirit to constrain me and fill me with the fruit of the Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. And just when it comes to debate night, watch what I'm doing to this guy. I will do to him what I've not done to anyone else. So, who, uh, iPhone? Why do I have an iPhone, first and last? What do you want me to have? Yes, hey, how you doing, Al? God bless you. Hey, brother, uh, this weekend, I'm coming up around your area. Batayin Tama. So let's see if we're into you. Oh, why? Well, not why. Do you? Have, yeah, I have an iPhone. Anyway, if you're in town. So I'll let you know. Anyway, good to see you guys. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. Let's glorify Jesus Christ. Let's focus on him and ask the Lord just to help me to overcome my flesh, crucify my flesh, and walk in the life of the Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit, life from the Spirit, in the life of the Spirit, to be transformed, to conform to the image of Christ. And listen, guys, I I try to be honest, right, with my issues. I, I know it comes as no surprise, no shock to anyone that obviously the things I struggle with, things that <clears throat> are issues with me, happen to be impatience, anger, and I can be very nasty to people that I don't like. I mean, that's been my prayer that the Holy Spirit helps me to conquer and crucify those areas and walk in the life of the Spirit. So, But I don't try to pretend to be something I'm not, nor do I want to justify that because I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit and make excuses for my sins. I want to die to my sins and walk in the life of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus, right? St. Dennis, I don't even know who's blocked. Some people were blocked by the other admins not me right and anyway, we're waiting for a few more faces to show up by the grace and mercy of lord jesus christ there are some issues we'll talk about there are some objections that were raised <clears throat> these are not new objections these are the common objections that muslims raise in their debates but i just listened recently to the debate between anan rashid and samuel green which took place what not two, not too long ago, less than two weeks ago. You guys know what I'm talking about? Samuel Green is from Australia, and Adnan Rashid is a Muslim da'i, an apologist debater from the UK. And he went to <clears throat> Australia to have two debates with Samuel Green. Green. One, one was, is Muhammad prophesied in the Bible? And the other one was, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I got to listen to most of the second one. Typical Adnan Rashid, same arguments, same distortion of scripture, same perversion of scripture, same misinterpretation of scripture. Same, same, same. Same, same, same. Right? Typical. 
not right now. I can't give you the link, but you can go to what is it? Season Apolog Apologetics, I think. That's a YouTube page. Same arguments, man. It's it's just tiring. It's really tiring. <clears throat> this is when you know someone. <clears throat> yeah, season apologist. Thank you, Saint Denis. I don't know why I said season apologetics. This is when you know someone <clears throat> does not care about truth. Rob, Rabbit Wolf, I am not able to because I can't find the name. So don't ask me again, please. I know you keep asking me. I can't find the name. Lord's K, Psalm 25. So I can't unblock a name I don't see. Hey, here we go again. Hey, Frankie, how long do you think you're going to last here? How long do you guys think this guy's going to last here? Here we go again. They're coming out already. Even I haven't started yet. All right. Okay, let's come back to the issue. Okay. Yeah, he's gone all right because I just blocked him. Here's a sure sign that someone has no <clears throat> interest in the truth, does not care about truth, does not care about being honest. When they hear a thorough refutation of their objection, in fact, an utter decimation, annihilation of their objection, but they still repeat the same objection over and over and over again. And that's a non rashid Same objections. I've actually done some live streams refuting his objections. I know people who are in contact with him that I'm pretty certain have made him aware of these responses, and yet it's the same objections over and over and over again. That's when you have no respect for such an individual. When a person has been corrected, in fact, when their objection has been decimated by the grace of the triune God, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the person still repeats the argument, then you know that person has no integrity. He has no honor. He is truly a son of Satan who, like his father, the devil, is interested in simply spewing lies in order to deceive people from the truth. And that's why I can't respect such an individual, right? Right? I can't respect such an individual. France Toma, I'd be shocked if any Muslim would debate me anymore. And the reason why, it's not because if they tell you it's because of my attitude, they're lying. Because they're very nasty, right? <clears throat> Blasphemous. And they can spew vitriol as well. It's because they're afraid of me. And I'm going to be honest. They're scared. They're afraid. And that's all glory to the triumph God, all glory to the Father, to the Son, the Lord Jesus, to the Holy Spirit that has anointed me. And empowered me with the wisdom and knowledge to strike fear into the hearts of the enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I give God the glory. May he crucify my flesh, destroy my pride, my arrogance, and save me from my flesh in Jesus' name so I can be more like Jesus, honestly. That's my prayer. Don't think I like being impatient and angry and snapping at people. I don't like those things. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a time and place to put someone in his place or her place and to stoop to their level ridicule, insult them, and treat a fool according to his or her folly. There is. But I want to work on being able to be more patient by the power of the Holy Spirit, exercising greater constraint, self-control, and walking more in the love and the life from the Holy Spirit, right? So pray for me so I can be successful in that area. And if you guys are wondering why I'm not starting the session, because I wait a few minutes, because we have enough regulars that show up, so it takes a few minutes for them to show up. So pray that the day will come, and it's not for numbers. May God purify my heart. I want more people so they can hear this and use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. Pray that one day, like David Wood, I want to have 300,000 subscribers and over 1,000 watching every time I do a live stream. And by the way, for the record, I've had two people. Yeah. Saved by grace. Uh, my brother, how long do you think you're going to last right now by being his messenger boy say by grace how long do you think you're last last right now can you give me a time how long do you think so that you can learn a lesson that as a christian you never become the dimmy of a muslim and his messenger boy how long do you think let's see guys how long do you think saved by grace is going to last and by the grace of jesus christ i won't insult people i'm just going to block them 
Hold on, let's see. Saint Denis, how long do you think you're gonna last, brother? How long do you think you're gonna last? You keep telling me what to do. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, you, Saint Denis. Okay. Okay, guys, I got a clean house because we're gonna have some distractions of the enemy. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ to to wash us and the Holy Spirit to seal us and protect us. Yep. 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 Here, hold on. I got to muscle somebody. Hold on. That's one. Let me clean house, guys, because I don't want Satan to distract. Folks, forgive me. I don't want Satan to distract us. We want to be in the spirit, filled with the fruit of the spirit, life from the spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. Hold on. Let's see. Hold on. Saved by grace. Where is saved by grace? Come out, come out, wherever you are. Hold on. One second. I can't find this guy. Why is he silent all of a sudden? Oh, there he goes. Come out, come out, wherever you are. All righty then. Anyone else before I begin? Any other distractions, nuisances? Huh? I don't want anyone to be distracted because, guys, when I'm distracted, you guys get distracted, and then we lose the focus. So by the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord, I don't want to be a stumbling block to you guys. So help me to help you focus, right? All right. Is Protestant here? He was supposed to be here, right? Did he show up? I guess he's a little late. I think he misunderstood the time. I told him seven. Oh, yeah, he is. So there you go, brother. God bless you. Tick tock, time to rock. Yeah, this is what I wanted to say before I got distracted. Okay. For some reason, I had two people, two people tell me, what's my beef with David Wood or if David Wood is evil because of the bantering back and forth? Are you guys kidding me? Don't you understand that David Wood and I banter back and forth? In fact, all of us do. That We have an apologetics group, apologetics team. David Wood, Vocab Malone, Adam Coleman, John, what you, what you meme, myself, and it's an honor for me to be part of that team, Anthony Rogers, Edward Dalcor, to name a few. We're all <clears throat> part of the same team, and we love each other to death for the sake of Jesus Christ. In fact, it's an honor for me to be part of that team. So for you guys to even think that, I have a problem with David Wood or he has a problem with me. Come on, guys. Don't you see that I do live show, live streams with him? Don't you see that he posted my debates with the oneness heretic? Don't you see that I was par part of the video that he did announcing the Christian A-team? And he's not here, but I just want to say something, and I mean this from my heart. Look, I've said it. I'll say it again. All of us have issues. I don't know of any apologists. With the possible exception of Anthony Rogers and even a brother, Edward Dalcor, I, I haven't seen any serious issues with them. But every other apologist I've met, we all, and I'm the first in the list, we all have serious issues. We have certain sinful inclinations, proclivities that we struggle with. We have certain temperaments that we struggle with because we are broken vessels, fallen, and we still are at war with our flesh, right? We all have issues. And the Bible says to expect that because what has God chosen? If you go to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 31, it says God has chosen the foolish things of the world. People rejected by the wise of this age, the scholars of this age. People looked down upon, marginalized, right? And God liberally chooses those who are looked down upon, the marginalized, those that the world considers to be fools and, and just vermin and, and waste. And sets them apart and empowers them by the Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. No, sinner, it's saved by you. I'm waiting just for a few more faces to show up. I have one in particular. I guess she's not here yet. So I don't know of any one of us who don't have issues. And because of our issues, we sometimes step on each other's toes and we get each other angry. David Wood has been angry with me many times in which he wouldn't talk to me for years. But because of the Holy Spirit in him, 
he always comes back. I always come back to him because the Holy Spirit has brought us together. And no matter what we do, the Holy Spirit will not allow us to separate. And I just want to say for the there she goes. That's who I was waiting for. See, thank you. She's here. Okay. And let me just repeat for the record. I'm going to say this, and I mean this from my heart. And I need you to pray for all of us because, because we're human beings. We can tend to be arrogant, proud, envious, and we want it to be about us. But may God save us from that by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the blood of Jesus wash us. May the Holy Spirit help me not to make it about myself and acknowledge the gifts in another person for the glory of Christ. Let me put it this way. In my estimation, are you guys ready? I want to take a moment because what does Proverbs 27 verse 2 say? Let's post it. Proverbs 27 verse 2. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Watch here. Watch here. Yeah, see, we have another barking dog, Kenny Telesco, son of Satan. He can't help it. The demon in him is just pricking his flesh to say something. Okay? A demon. And using foul language and then condemning me. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger not thine own lips. So here we're told, don't praise yourself. Right. And true heart, thank you. But Protestant believer, praise God for him and pray for him and his family. The Lord will bless them richly. He'll post verses. He's here to serve us for the sake of Christ. So thank you, true heart. But, you know, Protestant will do that. And thank our brother Pro Protestant and all the admins for helping me. Proverbs 27, 2 says, let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger, not thine own lips. Don't praise yourself. Let someone else praise you. So now I'm going to take a moment to acknowledge these great men and women of God that God has gifted for the glory of Christ because it's all about Christ working in and through them. Okay, now, in my estimation, are you listening? David Wood is perhaps the best, if not the best we have right now in refuting Islam. And he is one of the most brilliant Christian minds of the 21st century. And not just with Islam. When it comes to atheist, atheism, when it comes to logic, philosophy, God has blessed him. He is an intellectual beast. He is a giant intellectually by the power of the Holy Spirit. Honestly, and I don't just say this to say it. I mean it. Now, let me name some other theological beasts, giants intellectually. Anthony Rogers is amazing. He is an amazing servant of God. One of the most brilliant Christians, not just Islam. When it comes to Christianity, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the exegesis of the Bible, when it comes to issues related to the Bible and the core doctrines of the Christian faith. Put it this way. At one time, I embraced limited atonement. I don't believe it anymore. But put it this way. If Anthony Rogers were to say, I'm going to debate you on limited atonement, I wouldn't debate him. And I'm not saying I'm some great debater because the man is brilliant and he would tear me to shreds. And I have no problems admitting it. He's an amazing man of God. Another amazing man of God who knows scriptures and is solid, a top-notch apologist and passionate about exegesis of the Greek New Testament and also passionate for the Trinity is Edward Dalcor, Eddie Dalcor. He is a theolo theological giant. I love these brothers. They're amazing men of God. And when it comes to Islam, when it comes to Islam, let another praise you. So I'm praising these men, and I mean it from my heart. When it comes to Islam, his name is Edward Dalcor, Eddie Dalcor. He's got the website called ChristianDefense.org. Amazing. He knows the Greek New Testament like you know English. When he starts to exegeting the Greek New Testament, you sit there feeling like, boy, am I stupid. Yes, Denny, he does. Okay, now, when it comes to Islam, political Islam, Social, economic, military Islam. Robert Spencer is one of the best we have in the world today. No, Michael Storms, who said I'm better than him? And don't accuse me of false humility because I'm going to muzzle you. Who said I'm better than Anthony? I don't think I'm better than him. So cut it before I have to cut you and muzzle you. All right? No, you are stupid because you were dropped on your head and now you're mentally challenged. Here you go. Here, let's muzzle this dog. Down boy. <laughs> oh, that's a horse. I'm sorry. Yeah, he be bugging, man. Lopez, what's up, Blair? Give a shout out to my brother, Lopez Media Ministries International. 
He's another apologist who loves Jesus Christ. That's Lopez Media Ministries International. Luis Lopez, pray for that brother. Pray for his wife. God bless them, preserve them, anoint them, fill them with the spirit. All right? Pray for that brother. He's been coming on for a while, and I have failed to recognize him because I've been busy being attacked and attacking back. But bless this brother, Luis Lopez. Lopez Media International, top apologist, loves Jesus. Pray God will open more doors for him, and the Lord will use him and preserve him and his wife for the glory of Jesus, right? Robert Spencer is a beast. You know who's another beast? A giant? You know who's a giant in Islam? Islam's worst nightmare because he knows Arabic? Christian Prince, baby! Christian Prince! Christian Prince. And then we got some other great Christian preachers against Islam. Usama Dakdok in the Hizzi. He's not in the house, but Usama Dakdok. Usama, U-S-A-M-A -A Dakdok. A top brother who doesn't get the recognition he deserves by the grace of God. El Fadi is another one. I love him. And among the sisters, now we're talking about those witnessing to Muslims. Among the sisters in the Lord, the lioness of Christ against Islam, a warrior who's more bold than 10,000 men, more bold than me, makes me look like a coward. You know who? Hatun Tash of DCCI Ministries and also all the brothers that work with her. They're all lions and lionesses. Pray for them, praise God for them, and support them. She is a lioness. She makes us all look like wimps, honestly. She's in there in the face of men and not afraid to get beat up for Jesus. Right? Honestly, she's amazing. Hatun Tash of DCCI Ministries and, and all those who work with her. Daniel, right? All of them. Amazing. And I thank Jesus for them. So pray for them. Support them. Love them. And when it comes to Quran manuscripts, are you ready? Manuscripts of the Quran. Jay Smith is a beast. Starting to look like one. He's getting a little heavy. No, sorry, Jay. I don't mean to, you know, don't, don't attack me, Jay. Oh, and another one, another one that's phenomenal when it comes to Islam and Christian theology. Islam and Christian theology. He knows theology like the back of his hand and loves the Lord. And he's a humble servant. Tony Costa Jr. Tony Costa Jr. Okay. So pray that I will always recognize the gifts that God has given other members of the body of Christ and love them for it and pray for them and praise them for it. And that we will never be envious, never be jealous. May God save us from that. Right? And can I can I be honest? Can I speak from my heart? I'm about to begin. I hope I'm not boring you because remember, I'm taking a moment to praise people. Proverbs 27 verse 2. Can I speak from my heart for a moment? Can I, can I tell you? Oh, William Lane Craig, in my estimation, William Lane Craig is the finest, most influential apologist in the planet today because he is glorifying Jesus Christ to the academic community. He's meeting evolutionists and scientists and philosophers and taking them, right, in their own fields and showing them God is real, Jesus is risen, and he's alive. Thank God for William Lane, William Lane Craig. Thank God for him. But now can I... Can I Speak from my heart. Speak from my heart. Yep, he is. William Lane Craig is in a league on his own. You know, let, put it this way. To me, William Lane Craig, because of his influence, because of his brilliance, God has blessed him with a brilliant mind, and he loves Jesus. He would be, in my estimation, the Bruce Lee of apologetics. See, when you say Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee's in another league. Bruce is here. Everyone else is here. So over here, you can compare people, right? Here, you can say this guy is better than this guy, but Bruce is here. You don't even compare anyone to Bruce. Bruce, you're here. You're on another level. You're, you're, we're not even going to go there. That's how I view William Lane Craig. Okay. Uh, here we go again. Bob Fletcher, why are you a hater, bro? Why are you a hater? <laughs> you're lucky it's not a theological difference, bro. You're entitled to your opinion, T Tony Ferguson. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now here. 
It's okay, Bob. Bob, I'm going to have to agree disagree because here's the thing. Because it's not a theological question, you're entitled to saying that Tony Ferguson could beat Bruce Lee. The only thing he could do is eat Bruce's dust. But let's put that aside. Let me speak from my heart right here. Let me speak from my heart so we can begin. And guys, thank you for allowing me to torture you because I wanted to take a moment and praise these men and women. Praise these men and women whom God has used and is using to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm going to open up my heart and speak. I know with the recent drama and the recent <clears throat> back and forth and the recent social media wars, my anger towards this individual, my disappointment towards this individual is the result of how much love and respect I had and still have for this individual. And I'm trying to be honest. I do get angry at him, and I'm disappointed in him. And sometimes it just makes me want to lose my mind because of the way he is with other Christians. But can I just be honest? And I know a lot of Christians are going to say, come on, man. James White has been a blessing to me in my own life. He has. James White has been used by the Lord Jesus Christ to bless many people. And I can say to you, he's blessed me. He's been a blessing to my life. And in my early years in apologetics, I really looked up to Robert Morey. And unfortunately, he went the route he did. And now he's with the Lord. He had a big influence. And then James White did. And my anger with White stems from the fact that I had such a high view of him that I'm really hurt and disappointed and angry the way he doesn't see how ungracious he is in addressing other Christians, how he mocks, ridicules, and even attacks them, but he doesn't think he's doing it, and he's oblivious to it, and that he comes off so hateful and arrogant. I know there are people who will call him Muhammad James White and all that, but no, uh, I don't know. I just pray because two men that I highly love and respect, two men, two men I highly love and respect because they didn't check their pride. They ended up pretty much destroying their ministry. And I know I'm going to say this and people are getting angry. One of them was Robert Morey. Robert Morey was one of the most amazing theologians and debaters I met. But it, he, it, it got to a point where he was so unteachable. You could not say anything to him without him simply saying, you don't know Hebrew, you don't know Greek, and pretty much talking down to you and treating you like garbage. Right? And unfortunately, unfortunately, that's the route that James White is going. And can I be honest with you? It scares me. Can I tell you why it scares me? Can I open up and be honest with you guys? I'm trying to be I'm trying to be as honest without people thinking I'm being fake or without being a stumbling block. I see that in myself and I'm scared for myself. I see that in myself and I'm scared for myself. What do I mean? It's very hard for me to allow someone to correct me and show me I'm wrong. And I'm scared for me. I'm being honest. I'm not being false sense of humbleness. I, I'm scared. I honestly am. I really am. Because I know Jesus doesn't need me. Jesus doesn't need any of us. It is an honor, a blessing, and a privilege that God would use any of us. But since God is almighty, he raises up servants that he empowers for his glory. And when a servant is compromised... He can hand them over to discipline. And I'm scared. I'm being honest. I'm scared for myself, honestly. I really am. I really am because I see it in myself, right? I see that anger. I get angry when someone wants to correct me or challenge me. That anger kicks in, the pride kicks in, and the hatred kicks in. I I'm being honest. And I beg the Lord Jesus. And that's why I'm saying if you love these apologists, Pray that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will fill them and save them. Because Satan, Satan 
is going to do everything he can to destroy our testimony. Virginia Simon, if I could lessen it, I would. This is my point. If I could, I would. So that's, I'm scared. And I just want to say something. Yes, I do get angry at James White. Yes, I do lash out on James White. Yes, I can be harsh towards James White. But you know, at the end of the day, can I share something with you guys? Virginia, see now, you see you're doing the very thing I said. So you're trying to now challenge me and tell me what I can do when I'm telling you I'm weak in that area. Please, sister, don't fight me over my issues. I know my issues better than you. Can I be honest with you? If I sit down and I and I let my anger just dissipate, I love James White. I love the man. I love him. I do. Right? I just don't like the way he treats others who don't agree with Calvinism. I really don't. It really got me angry and upset the way he treated Dr. David Allen and Leighton Flowers talking down to them as if they're garbage. But... I love that man. I, I got to be honest. I have a soft spot for him, right? I do. Anyway, with that said, Proverbs 27, verse 2. Thank you guys for allowing me to sh be open with you and share with you. Uh, Raphael Israel. I don't know if it was clear when I said it. Because he's challenging David Allen to a debate on limited atonement. David Allen refuses to debate him because he doesn't like James White's ungracious attitude towards him. And James White makes it seem as if David Allen is using that as an excuse because David Allen is afraid of him. See, this is what I don't like about him when he does that. To me, that's a bully move, using your platform as a bully pulpit. And growing up, I didn't like bullies. Okay. You know, that said, thank you for allowing me to speak about Proverbs 27, verse 2. Uh, Bob Fletcher, you know I'm going to have to block you right now because I don't consider Muslims my brothers in Christ. Unless you think David Allen is a Mohammedan. Okay? Unless you think uh, David Allen is a Mohammedan, you're comparing apples and pineapples and only someone stupid like you would even think that that's somehow similar. They are afraid of me. That's why they don't debate. So David Allen is not afraid of James White. He won't stoop to his level because he thinks James White is ungracious and nasty towards him. Because you are stupid, Blob Fletcher. Right? In fact, here, I'm going to tell you something. And I'm going to be nice about it. You are a rabid dog, Bob. Bye-bye. See, I was nice, guys. I didn't yell. It's being very gracious and calling him a filthy dog. I mean a rabid dog. Okay. Bye-bye. Anyway, so for the record, David Allen is a brother in Christ who worships the triune God, and he's not afraid. Muslims are not my brothers. They worship a false God, and they are afraid. Okay? Now, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Forgive us, Father, for the sake of your Son, the Lord Jesus, and fill us with your Spirit. And Father, please wash us in the blood of Jesus. And please, Father, do not give us what we deserve. Give us what Christ has earned for us. Give us your grace, your mercy, your love, and be patient with us, Father, and help us to be patient with one another. And, Father, please help me in the areas I struggle. Crucify my flesh, Lord, so I don't bring shame to the name of Jesus, Lord. And fill us with life and power and fruit from your Spirit. And, Father, please, in Jesus' name, save us from our own flesh, from the desires of our flesh, from the instigation of Satan, so that we will walk in the life of the Spirit and bring you glory, honor, and praise in union with the name of Jesus, your Son. And help us to become more like Jesus. Please, Father, we need you. And please bless this session, Father. Please, for the people who are here, they're here for, for your word, not for me, Father. They're in love with Jesus, love with your word. And they, they trust and, and have faith that by your Spirit, I'll be used to teach them the word, to be blown away by your word. So, Father, please, for them, for them. Because you love them. You love me. Anoint me to bless them with wisdom from your spirit. To go deep into the word. Because the Bible is your word. It's true. You are truth. You are reality. Jesus is alive. He's risen. He is Lord. 
Please use me, Father. Lord Jesus, use me to glorify you. Holy Spirit, fill me to glorify Christ and bless your people, Holy Spirit. Seal them and be with our loved ones. Be with my daughters and preserve them for the glory of Jesus. Fill my lungs, my chest, my throat with health, Holy Spirit. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And Holy Spirit, save us from our flesh, from false sense of humility, pride, arrogance, or self-righteousness and justification. And give us victory to walk in your life, because we need you. In Jesus' name. All right. Are we ready? In Jesus' name, heal my sight. Lord, I'm getting old. I'm not young. All right. Three things I like to discuss today. And Lord willing, I promise you, by the grace of God, in Jesus' name, by the grace of God, in Jesus' name, I'm going to continue my series on Is Jesus Christ the Archangel Michael? Because I'm going to have a lot, a lot of segments because I'm going to thoroughly decimate that lie for the glory of Christ. And then eventually I'm going to do other series. I'll be going into salvation, the authority of Scripture, inspiration of Scripture, a host of topics. And then I'm going to start a series answering common objections by Muslims. And I'll do a series answering Common Objections by Joe's Witnesses. I plan on doing a lot of stuff if God is pleased to use me, but that's where I need your prayers. Pray God keeps me holy, pure, in love with the Lord Jesus, walking in obedience, saving me from my flesh, saving my children, and providing the provisions we need. Okay, so today I'm going to address some points that were raised by Adnan Rashid in his debate with Samuel Green. They had a debate on whether Jesus is God, okay? So he brought up some objections, and I want to address them, but let me briefly touch on the atonement. I'm going to discuss the extent of the atonement, meaning the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the whole debate among specific Calvinists like James White and those who disagree with this particular doctrine known as limited atonement, also known as definite atonement, also known as particular redemption. Limited atonement is the doctrine that Christ died only for the elect whom God would regenerate by his spirit and give them the gifts of faith and repentance to turn to Christ and then receive the benefits of Christ's redeeming work, right? In other words, limited atonement, particular redemption means Christ died for the elect of God, right? For a particular people, the elect of God. That's limited atonement. You with me there? Because I'm going to show you one of the many passages that convinced me by the grace of God, limited atonement is not a biblical teaching, right? Now, if you want to hear responses to what, I, what I'm going to present, I would encourage you to go to Anthony Rogers or Edward Dalcor, right? Now, believe it or not, historically and even today, not all Calvinists hold to particular redemption. There are Calvinists who reject particular redemption, limited atonement. So it's not simply a Calvinist versus Arminian debate. Calvinist versus traditionalist debate, Calvinist versus Catholic debate, even within Calvinists, even within Calvinists, right? You have those who do not accept limited atonement or particular redemption or definite atonement, right? See, now, Gerard Perry, I don't know if he's chiming in because he just wants to clarify or he's trying to challenge me. Right, I don't understand what his intention is to try to say particular redemption actually sounds better than limited atonement. And then he says, I mean, unless you're a universalist, doesn't everyone believe in limited atonement? No, not everyone believes in limited atonement because there are Christians who are universalists. There are Christians who believe the Bible teaches universalism. So this is what we call a false dichotomy, a false dilemma. Please avoid the logical fallacies. Yeah, Andrew, let me help Andrew. Universalism basically teaches that every human creature will eventually be redeemed, even those in hell. They'll be taken out of hell because Jesus died for them. So when they go to hell, hell is not retrib retribution, right? Meaning God's punishment, judgment for their sins, but it's more restorative. In other words, it's, it's for the purpose of purging them refining them and purifying them of their sins so they can eventually enter glory, right? Universalism, that eventually everyone will be saved at the end. Okay, now, let me help Andrew Martin. Let me help Andrew Martin understand what limited atonement is. Okay, Andrew, because I love you and I respect you, Andrew. 
I'll take your word for it. Okay. Okay. Andrew Martin, among a particular group of Calvinists, there is a belief that says Christ died only for the elect, meaning those who will come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And that group called the elect have already been chosen before creation for salvation. In other words, in eternity, God has already determined those who will be saved, and those who will be saved, he calls the elect. And Christ came to die to redeem them, and the elect will then be made spiritually alive at some moment in their life, right? The Holy Spirit will awaken them, make them spiritually alive, and then enable them to turn to Christ and believe in Christ and then benefit from the death of Christ. That's limited atonement, right? You understand, Andrew Martin? The other view says Christ died for every creature. Christ died to accomplish the redemption for every creature, but only those who believe in Christ will benefit from the death of Christ. So this other view would make a distinction between redemption accomplished and redemption applied. Are you with me there? You understand the difference? Accomplishing redemption is not the same as applying it. Christ perfectly accomplished redemption, salvation for every creature. But in order for his work of redemption to be applied to you, you have to believe in him. So make, it, make a distinction between accomplishing redemption for everyone, accomplishing salvation, which Jesus did perfectly, and applying that work of redemption to an individual. Christ accomplishes redemption, but it's only applied to those who believe. You understand now? Everyone with me there? So we make a distinction between redemption accomplished, Christ accomplishing the salvation of every creature by his perfect life of obedience, even unto death on the cross, paying their debt of sin, Living the life they're supposed to live. So he accomplished redemption perfectly. He earned redemption by his perfect life and obedience even unto death. But it's not applied to a person until he believes or she believes in Jesus Christ. All right, you understand the difference between redemption accomplished and redemption applied? Just before I move on, does everyone understand the difference now? Accomplishing the salvation of creation, which Jesus did perfectly, and applying that salvation is not the same. He accomplished salvation, but it's not applied until you believe. Let me show you a passage. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. So, Andrew, if you got it, I'll move on. But Romans 3, verse 25. Romans 3, verse 25. Okay. Read with me, guys. Now, let's focus. Let's read. Let's learn. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, meaning a sacrifice that appeases God and removes his anger through faith in his blood. Did you catch it? Did you understand what Jesus did? He now appeases God, satisfies God's justice, removes God's anger for the sins we committed if we believe in the blood of Christ. Do you see the two? Christ accomplished propitiation, but it's not applied without faith in his blood. Do you see that in Romans 3.25? Guys, focus. Don't be distracted. I want you to learn. Let's look at it again. Romans 3.25. One more time. Romans 3.25, one more time. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Did you see what it says? Christ, the word propitiation simply means that Christ, by his death, 
satisfied the justice of God, removing his anger towards sinners who have angered God by sinning against him. But notice the caveat. The anger of God is removed for those who have faith in his blood. You see? So Christ accomplishes salvation, but that salvation will only be applied to those who believe. So if you don't believe, then what Christ accomplished will not be credited to your account. It will not be appropriated to you. You with me there? Exactly, Bill, Billy Mandalay. So even though at one time I firmly affirm limited atonement, I could not continue believing it because there were too many passages of Scripture that troubled me and bothered me. And the fences of limited atonement bothered me even more because I saw how weak they were, how unbiblical they were. And I'm being honest. Right? Now I'm going to give you one passage that if you interpret correctly, and I promise you this. If you interpret it correctly, people like James White can't answer it. They're going to pretend to be answering it, but they're not going to answer it directly, and they're going to try to tap dance around it. And I'm being honest. That's what they're going to do because they cannot refute it exegetically. Are you ready? Okay, medic. Limited tone means that Christ died only for believers whom God has predestined to salvation. I have no idea what this guy Trueheart is talking about. I don't know if he's uh, vaping. Yep, he does. He believes in Tulip. Okay, now let me show you a passage. Let me show you a passage that if you interpret correctly in its context, can I be honest without offending those brothers of mine, sister of mine who believe in limited atonement? This passage decimates limited atonement. It decimates it. Okay? Are you ready for the passage? Let's break it down. Colossians 1, we're going to read 15 to 17. Watch here. But I need your attention, not because I want you to pay attention to me. I want you to pay attention to the word. And ask the Spirit to fill us for the glory of Christ. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Let's read it. We're going to break it down in two sections. We're going to break it down in two sections. Who is the image of the invisible God? That's Jesus Christ, the firstborn of every creature. The firstborn of every creature. Now watch this. For by him, by him, now here's where I need your attention. For by him were all things created. Tapanta, remember that, all things created. Jesus, the Father appointed Jesus to create all things. Now pay attention to this, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he, Jesus, is, present tense, is before all things. He is eternal. He is timeless. He's outside of time and creation. And he's uncreated. And by Jesus, all things consist. So Jesus sustains everything. Okay, now, guys, I want you to look at 16 one more time. Look at 16 one more time. Post it one more time, Protestant. And I hope I'm not boring you with this. You're being blessed. You're being challenged. You're, you're learning. The depth of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture. Okay? Let's look at 16 one more time. Hold on. Ed, I'm doing a live stream. I'll get back to you, man. I know you miss me and you want my attention, but I'm live streaming. And in live stream, I just gave you a shout out and praised you in your ministry. So you want me to take it back? Okay. For by him... Were all things created that are in heaven? And that was, by the way, Eddie Dalcor, the guy I just told you is a great apologist who runs ChristianDefense.org. Now read with me. For by him were all things created that are in heaven. Post it one more time, Protestant. Sorry, man. I got the, a man, Protestant. He works hard, though I don't pay him a dime because he's, his reward is with Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus help me get my health back and be holy for the glory of Christ. One more time. For by him were all things created. Now, guys, I'm going to ask you a question. 
Read with me. It says, Jesus Christ created all things, and then it says, in heaven, on earth. All things that exist in heaven, all things on earth, Jesus created it. Is there anything in heaven and on earth that Jesus did not create according to 16? Is there anything in heaven and earth that Jesus did not create according to verse 16? Or is this passage crystal clear, crystal clear that Jesus Christ, our Lord, created every creature, every created thing everywhere, every creature in heaven, every creature on earth, he created? Clear, right? Okay, now if it's clear, let's look at Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Let's see if you get it. And you can go into the Greek. The Greek uses the same Greek phrases, expressions, prepositions. Okay. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. I need your attention here if you want to see why I rejected limited atonement. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. I hope you're blessed. I'll, you've been following with me? Okay, now read. For it pleased the Father that in him the Son should all fullness dwell. Now pay attention to 20. And having made peace... Through the blood of his cross, meaning made peace by his death on the cross. Blood meaning that he forfeited his life on the cross, that he died on the cross to make peace by him to reconcile all things, right? All things, tapanta, same phrase, unto himself to reconcile, make peace for all things, right? Between God and all things. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Wow. Now, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to post Colossians 1.20 and Colossians 1.16 back to back so you can see the connection. Colossians 1.20 and 1.16 back to back. This is why I challenged James White to debate me on the exegesis of this passage. Why do you think I chose this? First, I said, let's just debate whether the Bible as a whole teaches limited atonement. But he wanted to be more specific. I go, okay, I'm going to call you out. Colossians 1.15 and 20, and you'll see why. You'll see why. Now, read with me. Read with me. Notice the language, and I got the link to the Greek. If you want to read the Greek, same phrases, same prepositions used. Now, pay attention. And having made peace, Jesus Christ the Lord made peace through the blood of his cross, meaning the death he died on the cross brought us peace, peace between God and creation. By Jesus, by him, to reconcile some things all things, and it's the same phrase as in 16. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now, compare the language with 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth. End of story. If in verse 16, all things in heaven on earth means the entire creation, then in verse 20, when it uses the same language, all things in heaven on earth, doesn't mean all creation? So in verse 20, it doesn't mean that Christ died to make peace for all creation, everything in heaven and on earth, only the elect. Thank you, King of Kings. You got it. You can't tell me in verse 16 that Jesus created everything in heaven and on earth. Nothing is excluded, exempted. But then when the same language is used in verse 20, Jesus made peace by his blood for all things to reconcile everything on earth and in heaven. Same language that in 20 doesn't mean every creature, that Christ didn't die to save every creature, didn't die to reconcile all creation. If the language of verse 16 means all creation, then the same language in verse 20 has to mean the same thing. Right? You with me there? Why is that relevant to the exegesis of Colossians 1, 15 and 20? Notice what you just did. You brought a smoke screen. Jason, why, what does it have to do with what Colossians 1, 15, 20 is saying? Before you run to something else, deal with the exegesis of Colossians 1, 15 and 20. Renee, you're not listening. Because if all things mean evil and sin in verse 20, then all things must mean evil and sin in verse 16. Now, Renee, 
would you say that all things in verse 16 means evil or sin or means every creature? So then why would you then add to the meaning of all things in verse 20 to avoid the plain exegesis of the passage? So I'm going to turn it back on you, Renee. Renee, here's my question to you. And I do it lovingly. You're asking a question, but I'm going to ask a question. Does all things in heaven and earth in verse 16 mean that Christ created evil and sin? Yes, Aaron, it does. Who told you that he didn't shed his blood for angels too? You have bad theology, friend, and I'm going to show that in a minute. Be patient. And instead of running from my exegesis, can you answer my actual point? You see, here it goes again. Those who love their tradition more than scripture can't deal with the exegesis. Are you saying he shed his blood for angels? Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's what Paul is saying, and he says it in Hebrews 9, 23. So, Renee, let me ask you, let me answer your question. Let's take it one at a time. Be patient. Don't bombard me. Let's go one at a time, folks. I'll address all your objections. That's what I'm going to do to the white and debate as well. Raphael, who says that angels have to sin for Christ to reconcile them? Even the best of angels are still impure and not good enough to stand in the presence of God, and they need the grace of Christ to make them worthy to stand in the presence of God. Be patient. I will address your objections. Be patient. Wait. Now, Renee, does the phrase all things in heaven and on earth in verse 16 mean that Christ created evil and sin? I know that, Renee. I know, but I'm just okay. So then why should the same language, the frame, same phrase, all things on earth and heaven in verse 20 mean evil and sin? when we should take it to mean the very same thing it meant in verse 16, meaning every creature, the entire creation. Are you with me there, Renee? I'm going to say it again because I want to make sure you get it. Okay. Thank you, Rocco Flaviani. Here is someone who speaks Greek and can read Koine Greek. Am I lying? I have the Greek right here. Isn't the Greek the same in 16 and 20, Rocco Flaviani? He just said no matter how someone cuts it, the Greek is crystal clear. Sam is absolutely right. I speak Greek, read and understand Koine Greek. We learned it in high school here. Right? Evil came from creatures sinning against God. Because what is evil? To go against God's righteous standard. But don't ask me that question. Focus on the exegesis of this passage. And this is what I'm going to do to James White. So I hope he's ready. No, Angela. No, that's not what we said. Oh, my God. <sighs> okay. Renee, in verse 16 when it says, By him... All things were created in heaven and on earth. No one in their right mind would say that all things that Jesus created in heaven and on earth means evil and sin, right? In verse 16, right? Yeah, Roscoe, you don't need the Greek. You, the English perfectly interprets the Greek, but I'm only saying Greek because you have people like James White who want to scare you and intimidate you. We're going to argue on the Greek. Watch what I'm doing with the Greek. You see, I this is the bullying tactic again. This is where the bullying comes in, tries to intimidate you and bully you. Well, we're going to go into the Greek. Well, watch what I'm going to do to you when we go to the Greek. See, I don't get intimidated, man. I've learned a long time ago. That shows an insecurity and fear on their part when they have to adopt such bullying tactics, right? Okay, so, Renee, since no one would say that in verse 16, all things that Jesus created in heaven and earth means evil and sin, why then would you say in verse 20, all things that Jesus re reconciled by his blood in heaven and earth means evil and sin? Why would you introduce evil and sin in the phrase if evil and sin are not included in verse 16 as part of the all things that Jesus created? Thank you, Rocco. God bless you, brother. You with me there, Renee?
Everyone else, you understand? If in 16, when Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, by him all things, tapanta, all things were created in heaven and earth, does not include evil and sin. Because Jesus didn't create evil and sin. Creatures brought evil and sin by disobeying Christ. But all things that he created in heaven and earth means the entire creation. Creation, created things, created beings. Right? Then why would someone say in verse 20, when the same language is used, same language is used, all things Jesus reconciled by his blood on the cross in earth, in heaven. Why then would you say all things now includes evil and sin? If all things in heaven and earth in verse 16 doesn't include evil and sin, then all things in earth and in heaven in verse 20 doesn't include evil and sin either. What Paul's point in Colossians 1 happens to be, this is his point. Paul is saying the same creator who created all creation is the same one who redeemed it. Paul is saying the creator of all things is the redeemer of all things. The one who created it is the one who saves it. And the reason why he came to save it is because he's the one who created it to begin with. That's what he's saying. Is that clear? True heart, you're tempting me to block you. So keep doing it and you're going to be blocked. Is that clear? Paul's point is the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them is the same one who now comes to save the heavens and earth that he created. Sorry. Is that clear? Yes, mega. Creatures created sin, created, because sin is breaking God's moral law. So God cannot create sin because God cannot break his own moral law because the moral law is a reflection of God's character. So God cannot sin against himself. Joel, I didn't say God created sin. I just explained it. If you guys are not following my argumentation, I'm responding to Renee who brought up an objection. Okay. Instead of going to other passages, let's focus on Colossians 1. Did everyone understand how Colossians 1 and arguably prove, proves, I should say, that the same heavens and earth that Christ created are the same heavens and earth that he reconciles. And since Colossians 1.16 says Christ created everything in heaven and on earth, in verse 20 when it says he reconciled everything in heaven and earth, then that means that it has to refer to every creature that Christ died to accomplish the redemption, reconciliation of every creature. No one excluded. Right? Bye-bye, True. Don't ever come back to my page with your false heart. Hold on. Everyone got it? Andy, if I have to answer that a, a third time, sorry, brother, this channel is not for you. You need to leave. If I have to answer that again. Okay. So now here's one attempt to explain away the clear, irrefutable, exegetical meaning of Colossians 1. You know what the argument is that people like James White raise to try to get you to deny the plain reading of the text? See, the language says what it says. You can't get around it. Colossians 1 is a nightmare. For people like James White. It's true. It is. You can't get around it. So you know what they're going to say? Right? You know what they're going to say? Oh, so you believe in universalism. You believe that every creature is going to be saved because Christ died to save everyone. No, I don't believe in universalism. This is what we call a false dilemma, a false dichotomy. Remember what I said. 
just because Christ accomplished redemption doesn't mean it will be applied. Yes, Jesus did accomplish the salvation, redemption, reconciliation for every creature in heaven on earth. But what he accomplished won't be applied to any creature until that creature believes in Christ. So this is why when I heard these kind of objections by folk like James White to refute the plain meaning of Colossians 1, it only bothered me more. And this really upset him. And one DL, he got upset when I said, one of the reasons why I reject the limited atonement is because of all these verses and partly because of how bad James White's arguments are for limited atonement. And this is the honest to God truth. His arguments were so bad, it bothered me. And finally, I just said, I can't believe it anymore. There's too many passages that clearly teach Christ died for the salvation of every creature. And the attempt by folks who believe that he died only for the elect and trying to address these passages were so bad, it was eating me up inside. And by the way, I have a witness that I used to teach limited atonement. Al Dariush is here. Al, can you tell the people here who introduced the folks from where we used to live to limited atonement and who used to teach it, if he's still listening? He was one of the gentlemen that used to come to my Bible class for years because they used to teach a local Bible class. And if he's here, he'll answer. If not, he's driving, so he may be busy, right? Unfortunately, I was one of those. I was one of those. You see? Al Darius, you see it? It's right here. You did, bro. Did you hear it? Here's a man who can testify. For years, I taught the doctrine of tulip, and I taught limited atonement. There he goes, Al Darius, a precious brother in Christ, right? Send this guy on his merry way to his pope. Admin, send this guy to his pope. Now, do you see it there? But for years, I agonized over all these passages that I did not know how to honestly address. And then when I heard the arguments by James White, it even troubled me more. This is why I said... To someone, and I'll say it again, and you can take this as an attack, James White is one of the worst def defenders of limited atonement. In fact, he would do those who believe in limited atonement a favor by stop trying to defend it because his arguments are simply bad. Right? I'm being honest. It's not an attack. Just like he can criticize those that he disagrees with, and in the most ungracious manner, right, tit for tat, right? Can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. You can criticize and you can take criticism. Is that clear? Colossians 1, 15 to 20 is a nightmare. Is a nightmare to limited atonement. Truth. If Christ died for everything in heaven, and it's parallel to Colossians 1.16, that Christ died to redeem everything he created. So let me let me have you answer that objection. Did Jesus create Satan according to Colossians 1.16? Did Jesus create Satan according to Colossians 1.16? So Jesus didn't create Satan. Who created Satan? Someone else? Another God? See, people are already answering it. Medic, you answered it. King of Kings, you answered it. We're not talking about the evil in him. We're talking about the being that you know as Satan. Come on, Yeshua is God. You know better. Okay. So Jesus created Satan, right? So if Paul says, see, you guys have a problem with Paul, not with me. If Paul says Christ died to reconcile everything in heaven and on earth, which parallels verse 16, which says he created everything in heaven on earth. So if Satan happens to be one of those things that Christ created in heaven, and then verse 20 says Christ died, Christ died to reconcile everything he made in heaven and on earth, then that means Christ also died to accomplish the redemption of fallen spirit creatures like Satan, 
but they won't be saved because they won't believe and it won't be applied to them. You sure? You know I'm going to block you now, right? But before I block you, I'm going to let you bury yourself. And according to Colossians 1.16, Yeshua, did Jesus create Satan? Now watch, I'm going to block this guy. I'm going to let him refute himself. And I'm going to send him on his merry way because it's too much for him. Yeshua, don't go to Hebrews 2.16 and butcher it because I'm going to turn that passage against you and refute you. Stop running to other passages. Okay, Yeshua? I know what you're referring to, Hebrews 2.16, and that shows you you don't even understand Hebrews 2.16. Be patient. Be patient. What does Revelation have to do with Colossians 1? Are you saying Revelation contradicts Colossians? You see what happens to these clowns? When they can't deal with a passage, they run to other passages thinking they're addressing the objection. But all they're doing is, is pitting Scripture against Scripture. Yeshua, final chance before I muzzle you. Let's try it again. In Colossians 1.16, did Jesus create everything in heaven? And does that include Satan? Because Satan would be one of those things in heaven that he created. Don't waste my time. Sorry, guys. I hope you don't get upset. I don't want to upset you guys dealing with people or clowns who think they know Scripture and won't let Scripture speak. You got 10 seconds, you should, before I have to bounce you, block you. Okay. Okay. Bye bye, guy. You're a coward. You're a disgrace because you won't answer honestly because you'd rather stick to your tradition than let the Bible speak and let God be God. See, this is again one of the things I dis dislike. One of my pet peeves, something that agitates me and irritates me when people will not allow scripture to speak but have to distort scripture or explain away scripture or ignore scripture because it cuts at their man-made tradition and their erroneous understanding of scripture. Right? It upsets me to the upteenth degree. Now for the rest of you, for the rest of you, let's, let's work this out. Let's work this out. Are you ready? Let's bring out the implication of Colossians 1. Bye-bye, Andy. Andy, find you another channel, another teacher. Bye-bye, friend. Don't come back here. Hold on. Say hello to my little friend. Hey, uh, do me a favor for his last. Uh, block him, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Blacksmith. Okay, follow with me. Let's post Colossians 116 and 120 back-to-back. Colossians 116, 120, back to back. This is going to take me longer than I thought, man. See, even though I thought I was going to finish the point, I can't. Lytle, let me repeat what I've said in previous sessions. I have to read the comments because I engage the people here so I can know that they're understanding the point and not getting lost. So me reading the comments becomes necessary to help me, to help you, and to see if you're getting it by the grace of God's Spirit. Colossians 1, 16 and 1, 20. Okay. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Here's my question to every one of you. When it says Christ created everything in heaven and on earth, when it says Christ created everything in heaven and on earth, would that include Satan before he became evil? Does that language show Christ created everything in heaven and on earth? including Satan before he became evil? All right. Now, let's look at 116, 120 back to back. Hold back on the comments. Hold back on the comments so you can read the text. Colossians 1, 16 and 120. One more time. Okay. Al, I hope you're still liking this, even though I have to be Harsh with some of these people. Colossians 1, 16, 120. Richard, don't post. Wait. I love you, brother, but wait, please. Okay. 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Now jump to 20. Jump to 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I see, whether they be things in earth or in heaven. Do you see the language is the same? Lytle, now you're making me sin. Because I just asked you stop commenting, and you don't. So you're doing the very thing you're accusing others of doing to me. Okay. Do you see it's the same language in verse 16 and 20? Do you see it right? Okay. Blue day. Blue day, that means then he didn't reconcile a dog like you. Okay. So I'm glad you realized he didn't reconcile a dog like you. Oh, sorry. Damn it. Darn it. Darn it. Hey, are you still there, Al? Al, are you still there? I almost blocked the wrong guy. Send Blue Day on his merry way. Is Al still here? Al, are you? Okay, good. Is he here? Oh, my goodness. Darn it. Oh, no, he's here. Good. All right. Good, Al. God bless you, bro. Man, are the demons getting up upset. I thought I was going to take 10 minutes with this passage. All right, let's try it again. Now, let's go back and talk about dogs. So now, did Jesus create dogs or no? Did Jesus create cats or no? Did Jesus? Okay. So if all things, in verse 16, means Christ created everything, and that includes animals, so are you going to say that in verse 20, Christ didn't redeem animals? Are you sure that the Bible teaches Christ didn't redeem animals? Then your theology is very limited. Because the Bible says Christ came to reconcile all creation. Because, folks, sin has affected all creation, even the animal kingdom. You see how bad your theology is, folks? Because I'm going to blame pastors for not doing their job teaching you the Word of God in context. Sin has affected all creation. The entire creation has been affected, polluted by sin, even plant life and the animal kingdom. And that's why all creation groans for redemption. You want proof? Romans 8, 18 to 25, folks. Thank you, love light. The whole creation groans. Let's read it. So when someone is stupid enough to tell me that Christ didn't redeem dogs, that means you're an idiot, a fool, you don't know your Bible. Yes, Lytle, that's why animals attack each other. But when Christ reconciles creation and brings in the new heavens, new earth, guess what? Animals won't be feeding on flesh. They won't be feeding on one another. Animals will live in perfect peace with one another and with humans. And we're going to go back to eating fruits and vegetables, no more flesh. Can I prove that? Let me prove it now. Slow down on your texting and read. Romans 8, 18 to 25. Let's read. Sad, the state of Christianity today. Thank you. That's a compliment, Francisco. Thank you. I think Stephen Anderson has more guts than someone like you, a coward. Revelation 8, 18 to 25. Let's read. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Read with me. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. So creation, distinct from the sons of God, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, waiting for the sons of God to appear and be what they're destined to be. For the creature, meaning creation, was made subject to vanity. Wait. Creation was made subject to vanity? Not willingly, not of its choice, but by reason of him, God, who had subjected the same in hope, because the creature, meaning creation itself, also shall be delivered. Delivered from what, folks? From the bondage of corruption. Creation is bound to corruption? Into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Creation will be liberated with the children of God. 
Wow. For you know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. For we know that the whole creation groaneth. And not only so, read 23, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For when a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And then 25. Let me see where 25 is. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Did you catch it? All of creation. That's distinct from the sons of God. The creation eagerly awaits to be redeemed from its corruption. So only someone would be stupid enough to assume that Christ didn't come to redeem even the animal kingdom from its corrupt state, the animal kingdom from it being affected, polluted, tainted by sin. Yes, Zena, you want to know? You want proof that animals know there's a God? When God commanded the great sea creature to swallow Jonah, that means that sea creature knew this was the voice of its creator and obeyed instantly. And when God commanded that sea creature, right, to then vomit Jonah, immediately it heard, obeyed, and did what the creator told that sea creature <clears throat> what to do. Yes, Zena, who told you animals are not aware of the voice of their creator? And that the creator can speak their language and they can understand and discern the voice of their creator. Thank you, John Neal, who silenced the lions and prevented the lions from eating Daniel. Are you aware that even animals will have to stand in judgment before God for killing humans unlawfully? Zena. Are you aware that the Bible says that even animals will be judged by God for killing humans unlawfully? Genesis chapter 9, verses 4 to 6. Genesis chapter 9, verses 4 to 6. Yes. Genesis 9, verses 4 to 6. Let's read it. Man, do I have to do a lot of teaching. Hey, Francisco. You are a fool, an idiot, a coward, and stupid. So you want me to be like Stephen Anderson? You are an idiot. You're a fool. You're a coward. Take a hike, mister. Genesis 9, verses 4 to 6. Read with me. But flesh with the life thereof, flesh with the life on it, meaning the blood, shall you not eat. You cannot eat an animal with blood in it. You got to drain the blood. Now watch verse 5. Everyone, read 5. I didn't write this. Moses wrote it, and God is saying this to Noah and his family. God is saying this, and surely your blood of your lives will I require. If someone kills you unlawfully, I will require it at the hand of your murderer. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. Wow. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Did you catch it? Verse 5. I will require your lifeblood even from a beast who unlawfully kills you, not just from human beings. Genesis 9, verse 5, one more time. Genesis 9, verse 5, one more time. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. Pay attention, Zena. At the hand of every beast will I require it. You beast, why did you kill that man unlawfully when that man is in my image? So where did you get the notion that beasts don't understand the voice of their creator, that beasts do not have cognition, awareness, right? And where did you get the notion that Christ doesn't come to even redeem the beasts? No, Zena, God has now allowed you to eat animals without blood in it. But when Christ comes to usher in the new heavens and the new earth, there'll be no more flesh eating. We're going to live at peace with the animal kingdom, 
Animals at peace with other animals. Humans at peace with animals. Humans at peace with other humans. And all creation at peace with God. You hear me there? Choose. Yes, you can. Because the blood is already drained from the steak. Right? Obviously, you're not going to get every, you know, little pint of blood. Meaning when the animal's killed, the blood is drained out of the animal's body. That's it. So don't worry about steak. In fact, if you're going to eat steak, invite me and you pay for it. I'll be there. Guys, what does rare steak and medium rare steak have to do with the point? By the time the steak gets to the chef, the animal that was killed, the blood was shed, right? Hopefully, right? That's the only prerequisite. The blood of the animal has to be shed. So no blood sausage for you Germans. Okay. Before I move on, I think many of you got overwhelmed, got shocked, got rocked by what I just said. Okay. To answer the question, is it clear that Christ redeems everything in heaven and earth, which would include even animals? Let me prove to you that animals are suffering because of sin. When a dog gets cancer and dies. Do you think that God originally created dogs to get cancer and die? When a dog goes blind, when a dog gets arthritis, do you think that God created a dog to suffer these debilitating diseases and that God doesn't love animals, that he's cruel to them? Or is this all the effect of sin that is even affected the animal kingdom and plant life. And do you think in the new heaven and the new earth, new heavens and new earth, when they're animals, that in the new heavens and earth, animals will have arthritis, go blind, get cancer, and die? And do you want proof that even animals... We're created with the desire of living forever because that desire was placed in them by their creator. Do you want proof? Can I give you proof? Why does a dog cry when a dog realizes it's dying? Why does an animal run for its life when attacked by a predator? Why do even animals want to spare their life, preserve their life? Why is it they run from their predator who's about to kill them and eat them? Where do they get that desire, that sense that they want to live, they don't want to die? So Lytle, let me now apply your... Lytle, you know I got to get rid of you now. So when a lion is about to attack... An animal. That animal has not felt the pain of being eaten by a lion. How does that animal know about the pain of the lion? Why is it running? Lido, you know you got to go, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, I love you. Sorry, I do love you, though. No, I'm sorry. I can't I can't deal with distractions. Like, I'm sorry, I can't. Like I said, I'm not for everybody. This channel is not for everybody, honestly. You know, thanks, right? So why does it, when a dog's about to die and realizing it's about to die, it start crying or animals run from their predators? Where do the animals get this sense, this desire, this feeling of wanting to live and preserve their lives? Nate, the one who gave them life. Do you think God created life for it to end or God created life for it to live forever? Before I move on, this took much longer than I thought. It's amazing. I didn't think it was going to be that difficult.
Is it making sense now? Before I move on? Is it making sense? Let's read Proverbs 12.10. Proverbs 12.10. Exactly, Nada. But Proverbs 12.10. Let's see what God says about the righteous and how much God loves even animals. Proverbs 12.10. I don't know what you're saying, Sam. You're right. No. I think you're going to get blocked too. Notice Proverbs 12.10. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. Bam. But the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Did you catch it? God considers you righteous when you care for the life of your animal. Proverbs 12, 10. See, a righteous man is one who even cares for the life of his animal. See it right there? That's why I care for idiotai. No, no, I say I care about you because you're an animal. <laughs> you see that, Proverbs 12, 10? Read it one more time. Let's write one more time. Proverbs 12, 10. A righteous person in the sight of God is not someone who simply loves human beings, but he loves and cares for animals and the plant life. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. Did you catch that, Al Dariush? And if anyone knows, Al Dariush knows because he had a dog that was like family to him. Now let me show you how much God loves the animals that he made. He doesn't love them as much as humans, but he loves them. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Exactly, King of Kings. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Exactly, medic for Christ. It is true. A lot of serial killers started off by killing animals and then worked their way up to humans. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when it treadeth out the corn. Did you catch what God told the Israelites? When you have an ox that's treading out the field for you, don't muzzle it, stopping it from eat, eating, right, from the ground. That's cruelty. You don't do it to that ox. If the ox is treading out the grain, the field for you, then that animal deserves its wages too. Let it eat. Don't get too animated because you're reacting. We'll have to react. Did you say that, Deuteronomy 25.4? Zina, because it's what I'd call, quote-unquote, a necessary evil. Not that it's evil, but God says, in this fallen world, in the meantime, I will let you eat animal flesh. That's a concession on the part of God for us and our benefit, showing you how much he loves you. So he allows you for now. But when Christ restores the earth to be what it initially was before Adam and Eve and Satan messed it up, then it's going to be complete harmony, complete peace between animal and animal, between humans and animals, between humans and humans, and all creation with God. And at that moment, animals won't be preying on other animals. Can I show you that? Exactly, virtual warfare. Can I show you that now? Don't ask me about dietary restrictions. Notice what you guys did. Notice the short attention span. We're talking about Christ reconciling all things in heaven and earth. That includes even animals and angels. Now we're going, can I eat shrimp? How about a uh, sausage? Can I eat McDonald's? Come on, guys. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. I'm not 1 Corinthians. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. Let's break it down. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. Let's break it down. Guys, slow, slow down. Let's read. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. Let's read. Exactly, choose Jesus. But it doesn't say the lion will lie with the lamb. Just to let you know. Okay, let's read. Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 5. Read, guys, please. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. This is a prophecy of Jesus. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah, 
and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of Jehovah. He shall not judge after the sight of his ears, eyes, I'm sorry, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with <clears throat> the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Now watch the rest of it. Isaiah 11, 6 to 10. Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 10. Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 10. Watch here. No, it's okay. Read now. The wolf also shall deal with the lamb, not the lion. That's another misinterpretation of scripture. It's not the lion with the lamb. The wolf with the lamb. You know what, what Isaiah is telling you? When Jesus restores the earth, the lamb won't fear the wolf anymore because the wolf will not prey upon the lamb anymore. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf with the young lion. Wow. So lions won't attack calves. Wolves won't attack lambs. And leopards won't eat the kid, meaning the kid of a lamb, a you, right? And the fatling together and the little child shall lead them. If you put a child in front of a leopard or a wolf, right, or a lion, they will tear the child to shreds. Not when Jesus comes and restores creation. And the cow and the bear shall feed. The young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. No more meat. And the suckling child shall play. <clears throat> sorry, hold on. And the suckling lion. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, suckling. Suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, so won't bite it. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den, meaning the den of a serpent. Serpent won't bite it. They shall not hurt, nor destroy. No more killing. Animals won't kill animals. Humans won't kill animals. Animals won't kill an uh, humans. No more on my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Jehovah as the waters cover the sea. And in that day shall there be a root of Jesse and shall stand for an ensign, a sign of the peoples. To, to it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. Did you catch it? Did you guys catch it or no? Zena, did you see it? The leopard, the lion, the wolf, the lamb, right? <clears throat> the calf, the, the, the serpent, the ox, they'll all live together in perfect harmony, in perfect peace. No more killing one another. Animals won't kill animals anymore. Animals won't kill humans anymore. Serpents won't bite humans anymore. And a child will lead the lion, and a lion will be like a puppy in the hands of a child. No more violence, no more death. And it says the lion will eat straw like an ox. Do you see it? Do you see it or no? Before I move on. Man, my discussion went into a different direction. All right. I'm going to have to change the title again. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. Zena, are you learning too? Choose Jesus. Are you guys learning? Okay, Zena. Here, hold on. Let me, let me, hold on. I love this sister. She's Chaldean. She's feisty. Zena, hold on. Yes, uh, Michael, I know you're in heaven. Is Gabriel there? Okay. I need you to relay a message. We have a sister on earth that's still upset, and she says it's weird, that God would allow and make a concession that we can eat animals now. Can you please send someone to change those parts of Scripture? Because I don't want her to feel weird anymore. Okay? All right. Yeah, it's me, Sam, by the way, Michael. Hopefully I'll see you soon. Love you. And kiss Gabriel for me. <laughs> what, do you, what do you want me to tell you, man? No, honestly, you got to admit, we Christians were a weird bunch. 
God allows us to eat meat, and she's still upset about it. <laughs> uh, only Assyrian Chaldeans, huh? Uh, Assyrian Chaldeans. Okay. All right. Anyway, Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. Yeah. Lisa, thank you. Jesus ate fish. In fact, uh, not only did Jesus eat fish, did you know, Zena, in Genesis 18, Jehovah God Almighty appeared to Abraham with two angels in human bodies and ate meat, a fatted calf. They ate meat. God himself ate meat in Genesis 18 with two angels. They appeared in human bodies and ate meat. So God himself says, hey, you know what? I like the fact that I made that concession because now I can also enjoy meat with you guys. Billah. That's what it is. You're trying to now say, see, I should be vegan. See, I was right. Uh -huh. But Zina, God himself isn't vegan. Jesus appearing to Abraham in a human body, in Genesis 18 with two angels, ate a fatted calf. And then Jesus, during his life on earth and after the resurrection, ate fish and ate the Passover lamb. In your face, Zina, it's meat all the way, baby. Psst, 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 psst. All right, anyway. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. So let's read. It's vegan, sir. All right. Let's read. Guys, read this. Slow, your, slow down. Read. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Read. Isaiah 65, 17, 25. For behold, I create new heavens, new earth. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Now read verse 18. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Okay, a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and join my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her. No more weeping will be heard in her. No more mourning, no more death, no more disease, no more violence. Nor the voice of crying. Now notice 20 all the way to 25. There shall be no, no more than an infant of days, meaning an infant that dies as an infant, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the, the child that dies 100 years old, right? You're going to be shocked. A child that dies at 100 years old, man, that's too young. Let me, I lost my place. Hold on. That's because of too many texting. Hold on. All right. <clears throat> this is what happens. Too many texting, right? But the sinner... Yep, being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses, verse 21, and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. You won't build a house and someone takes it away from you. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, as the, are the days of my people and my elect. As, as long, as many years a tree lives, that's how long you live during this period, which refers to the millennial reign of Christ. But pay attention. 23 to 25. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of Jehovah and their offspring with them. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith Jehovah. One more time, verse 25. This is during the new heavens, new earth. One more time, verse 25. It's okay, first and last. 25. What are you going to do? Too much texting? I'm going to lose my, my place. Verse 25, one more time. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Impossible. You put a lamb in front of a wolf, the wolf will tear the lamb to shreds. Not during this time. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock. Impossible. Put a bullock in front of a lion, the lion will tear the bullock to shreds. Not during the time when Christ comes and ushers in his reign and the new heavens and earth. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith Jehovah. Did you guys catch it or no? So we will continue to eat fruits, vegetables, and plants. We'll be on a plant diet. But no more flesh. Yes, that won't change Revelation 22, 13. Plant death will continue to exist 
because God is pleased to allow us to continue to eat plants, fruits, vegetables. So during that time, we will be vegans. Not in heaven, Dariush, on earth. This is coming down to the earth. When Christ comes to the earth, and then God the Father joins them on earth. Is that clear? How much time have I spent? Man, it's almost two hours. All right. I'm going to have to change the title of the message again. I didn't even get to the D of Christ and the missions of the Spirit. All right. Everyone with me so far? Does it make sense? Is it clear to everyone? He didn't just give grass to animals. He gave it to human beings, life and light, love and light. In the beginning, we're Genesis 1, we're told humans and animals could eat plant life, fruits, vegetables from the trees. It was only after the flood in Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, in Genesis chapter 9, where God then says, now you can eat meat without blood in it. But to answer Zena's question, yes, even animals have what we call cognition, meaning they have awareness. Even animals have emotions and have intellect. And even animals have personalities. Did you know that? How do I know animals have personalities? Why is it no two dogs are alike and they have different characteristics and personalities? Well, we see in Genesis 9, they do, right, Zena? Because one of the things that God has told animals, you cannot kill humans unlawfully. Unlawfully. That means God is going to judge them by a standard that he has made known to them, that they are aware because they can understand the voice of their creator who created them, and the creator can speak their language. And animals do have languages. How do dogs communicate with one another? What about dolphins? What about monkeys? What about apes? They have their own way of communicating. But who created them with that ability to communicate with one another? Their creator. So are you saying their creator doesn't understand their language and can't communicate with them? You with me there? You with me there? Do you want me to show you that animals also have souls, that they're living souls like human beings? You want to see that before I conclude? So, Raphael, you're letting Kevin distract you with something that has nothing to do with a topic, and he's going to get blocked. Which part you didn't hear, Zena? I don't know which part you didn't hear. Your brother is distracting you. Do you want me to show you? Let me repeat that part because I don't know what part she didn't hear. Choose Jesus. You got to stop distracting her, bro. She's a very fiery woman. She'll smash your face in. Okay. Don't animals have their own language, way of communicating to each other? Don't dogs communicate to each other? Don't <clears throat> apes communicate to each other? Dolphins communicate to each other? So you notice that even the animals have their own unique way of communicating their own unique language. Who do you think created them with their unique ways of communicating? The creator God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So the one who created them with that language to communicate, he can't communicate to them on their level. He can only speak human language. He can only communicate on our level. He can't communicate to a dolphin with a dolphin understanding the voice of his creator. Scott, I wouldn't be surprised if they will be in heaven. Yeah, Cheryl, Cheryl we went off topic because someone brought up, Jesus didn't redeem dogs. Who told you he didn't? Jesus didn't? So when Romans 8, 18 to 25 says, the entire creation, including animals, are groaning because they have been subject to corruption, right, to pollution, to decay. Which is why a dog, let me repeat it again, which is why a dog can contract arthritis, go blind, even have diabetes, 
and cancer. Why do you think this is happening to a dog? Do you think God created a dog to have these diseases? God created a dog to contract cancer? Or is this the effect of the fall of Satan's sin, rebellion, of human sin and rebellion upon all creation, the stars, the moon, the sun, plant life, tree life, right, marine life, You hear me there? And you think Christ is not going to redeem even animals from the diseases that they suffer because of sin? You don't think he's going to redeem them? So that in the new heavens and earth, the animals around us will still continue to contract cancer, arthritis, and go blind and die? When Revelation 21 says in new heavens and new earth, no more death. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. You with me there? I'm trying to let it sink in. Is it clear? What this is supposed to teach you? Sorry. Sorry. Here it goes again. I don't know why you're laughing. Yeah. You know what this is supposed to teach you, folks? Because I keep uh, buffering. It's supposed to teach you the gravity of sin that one human couple and an evil spirit creature sin and brought misery and pain and corruption to the entire creation. And God is trying to teach us a lesson. You see, your choices don't only affect you. It affects everyone around you, whether you like it or not. So are you now, are you now going to live responsibly? And are you going to live in a way with the realization that whatever you do is going to affect someone else, even an animal, even a plant, even a tree, whether you like it or not? So are you going to keep living selfishly? Or now are you going to live with the awareness, man, if I do this, it can not only hurt my wife, my children, my parents, my siblings, but can also affect the plants around me, the trees around me, and animals, including my dog. In fact, isn't pollution killing our trees? And who's polluting the earth that's killing our trees? Animals or humans? Yes, water and light. Beautifully put. Islam, it's done. That, that, that ship has sailed. May God forgive her. May convict her to repent and move on. I'm free. Okay? By the grace of Jesus. Yeah. Islam, you know you're leaving my page, right? Okay, buddy. Sorry. Some people don't learn. Okay. Goodbye, friend. Some people just don't learn. They just got to keep talking and pontificating and chiming. All right. Now, I'm now going to answer the question that you asked. Do animals have souls? Do, ha do animals have spirits? And we're going to end it with this, right? You ready? You ready? No, he wasn't an evil Muslim. He's a Christian. He's trying to now, you know, console me. Okay, are you ready? Exactly, choose Jesus. It's proven, right? You put certain type of music and plants die, and you put soothing music and they grow faster. This is a fact. This is not this is a scientific experiment. It's been done. Where they put heavy metal, hard rock in front of plants and the plants die. Did you know that? But when they put like say Bach, Beethoven, the plants grew faster. Same thing with, with mice. They put mice in a maze. When they put heavy metal or, or hard rock, the mice kept bumping into the walls of the maze, couldn't find its way out. Did you know this? This is a fact. I'm not lying. It's a fact. Exactly, Susan Baker. See, Susan hit it on the nail. Amazing the difference when love is shown to all life. Yes. Did you know why, Susan? Let me let me expound on that. Susan said something beautiful, and I believe it was the Holy Spirit who prompted you to say it. 
amazing the difference when love is shown to our life. Did you know why, Susan? Love is the key and the glue and the one quality that heals those that are broken because the triune God created everything in love. God created things in love. So the love of God is the glue that keeps everything together. And it's the love of God that heals, restores, and amends. So love is that quality that brought all things into being. The love of God. So what you said is beautiful because love is the characteristic, the quality that moved God to create in the first place. Right? You hear me there? JSB, that's between you and the Lord. I listen to secular music, but use discernment and let the Holy Spirit convict you. Because we do have certain freedoms in Christ, but we cannot abuse those freedoms and sin and cause others to sin. Is that clear? In fact, let's take dogs again because some of you are dog owners. Let's take dogs again. Notice the difference between a dog owner that loves his dog and a dog owner that abuses his dog. A dog that is loved, how does that dog turn out? A dog that is abused, how does that dog turn out? You with me there? You see the my point? So what our sister said, Susan, spot on, spot on about love. Because if you ask, why do we exist? Why does creation exist? Why did it come into being? Because of the love of the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in their infinite love, created all things from their love as an expression of their love for the Son and also to have others outside of God's being to share in this infinite love that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have enjoyed and experienced from all eternity. <clears throat> Clear? Now let me end it with showing you that animals have souls. They are living souls like human beings. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready now? I'm going to show you that even animals are living souls who have the breath of life in them who are animated by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit animates them. As he does human beings. If you're ready, that means you're going to listen. Okay. Let's go to Genesis 2-7. Genesis 2-7. You can call me tomorrow, brother. Yes, God willing. Genesis 2-7. Pay attention now. I'm going to have to change the title of the, of the discussion. And Jehovah God, formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Did you catch it? When God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man become, became a living soul. Now, here's where your translations do you a disservice. So I'm going to give you the link to the Hebrew, okay? Give you a link to the Hebrew. Okay, here you go. You're going to have to click on it to see this point. You're going to have to click on it. The Lord Jesus comfort you, Cheryl, and fill you with his infinite love and joy, knowing your son is more alive in the presence of Jesus, and you will be with him forever. Okay, click on it. Okay, click on this link. Look at the word for living soul. Look at the word for living soul, right? It's nefesh chaya. Nefesh Chaya. Do you see it? It's not nefesh chaya. 
Okay. You see it there? Does everyone see the expression? Did you click on it? Do you see it says? Nefesh Chaya. You got to click on it. So when God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam, he became a living soul. Nefesh Chaya. Do you see it? You guys got to see it before I move on. Focus. You asked me to prove it to you. Focus. Yes, it is, says Syrian. Because Hebrew and Syrian are cognate languages. Everyone saw it, right? Okay. Now here's what you don't see in your English translation. All right. Genesis 2.19. Post Genesis 2.19. Genesis 2.19. Guys, medic, everyone pay attention. Genesis 2.19. No, the, the word order is Nefesh Chaya there. Read Genesis 2.19. And out of the ground, read this, guys. I need your attention. Come on, please. Out of the ground, Jehovah God formed every beast of the field. Now, this is animals. And every fowl of the earth, birds, those that fly, and brought them unto Adam to see what we would call them. Now, notice this. Now, your translation did you a disservice, even though I love the King James. And whatsoever Adam called every... Living creature, that was the name thereof. See here, it translated living creature. Go to Genesis 2.19. Do you know what the word for living creature is? Same exact words in Genesis 2.7. Nefesh Chaya. Nefesh Chaya. Notice, Adam and the animals and the birds are all called Nefesh Chaya, Living souls. The word nefesh is the word for soul. Proof that animals and birds are living souls like human beings. Proof right there. Click on it. See. Same phrase. Nefesh chaya. So notice. Human beings are living souls. Animals and birds are living souls. But a human being is a living soul because God breathed the breath of life in his nostrils, which means he did the same for animals and birds. They too, God breathed into them the breath of life, making them living souls. Bam! They are soulish like we are. They are soulish like we are. You with me there? Before I move on, did you get it? How many of you saw clearly the Bible teaches animals and birds like humans are living souls? Nefesh Chaya. But to be a living soul... That means God had to breathe the breath of life into your nostrils. Genesis 2.7. So God breathed the breath of life in the nostrils of humans and animals and birds, making them all living souls. So they're all soulish. Look at this guy. I, I don't know how to, how to answer someone who says humans lose weight at death, animals don't. That means that means they don't have. <laughs> oh my goodness! Sorry. Oh boy. Okay. Did everyone get it? Not laugh my a o payday. It's laugh my b o butt off. You wanna? You don't wanna use the word aspirations. Okay. You with me there? Did you understand? Now you have biblical proof that when you look at your dog. Your dog is a living soul. I hope this changes your attitude towards animals, especially your pets. They are not insignificant bags of molecules in motion. They too are living souls. Clear?
Okay, now is that clear? Because I'm going to give you more proof and we're going to end the discussion. I'm going to have to change the title now. I hope you still were blessed, challenged, shocked, wowed, and stand in awe of the Word of God and the wisdom knowledge that the Holy Spirit gives us. But we got more. I got more, but I need you to pay attention because I did a marathon because, Lord willing, I won't be able to live stream for a couple of days. So I want to go out with a bang for a couple of days. So it's going to be a marathon session, right? Okay. Now, Genesis 6.3. Andrew, I hope you benefited too, that from the biblical perspective, animals are not just material beings. They're also soulish entities. Genesis 6.3. Let me explain this. But you got to read, read with me and pay attention. But Andrew, it's only the Christian worldview that gives value to dogs. In an atheistic, naturalistic, materialistic worldview, dogs are nothing but Bags of molecules in motion. But your love for your dog shows that you know they're more than that. Which is why when you lose your dog, you're devastated and heartbroken. Because you know, because you're created in the image of God, Andrew, and God's law is written in your heart. Okay, now, Genesis 6.3, one more time. Yeah, Aaron, well, that was Proverbs 12.10, Aaron Wiseman. Proverbs 12, 10. But Genesis 6, 3, guys, read with me because I'm going to explain what it means. This is about the flood. And Jehovah said, my spirit, my spirit shall not always thrive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. Okay. Let me repeat this passage. Please listen. I want you to be blessed and blown away by how amazing this book is because the one who authored this book is amazing. He is the true God. Genesis 6, 3. And Jehovah said, my spirit will not strive with man, won't remain with man, won't contend with man, for he is also flesh, meaning he came from the dust, being flesh shall return there, yet his day shall be 120 years. Now let me explain what God is saying here. Let me explain what God is saying here. Okay, listen to me and see what he's saying. It's talking about God destroying the earth by a flood. God bless you, Smith. God destroying the earth by a flood. He's saying, I'm tired of man, and my spirit won't remain with man because man is flesh, meaning man is destined to die, and I'm only going to put up with him for 120 more years. See, people ask me, what does it mean his days are 120? It means that from that moment that God spoke, Right, God would only put up with man for another 120 years and then he'd bring the flood and destroy all flesh. Meaning man only has 120 years left before I take away my spirit from him. Are you with me there? You understand what Genesis 6, 3 is saying? Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 is saying, my spirit won't remain with man indefinitely. I'm only going to put up with men for 120 years. Then I'm going to bring the flood to destroy them. That's when I take the spirit away. That's when my spirit will stop striving being with man. Okay. Everyone understood the point of Genesis 6.3. If you're still confused, tell me I'm confused or put a two. So I want you to get it. No, it's not about the age of dead, Zina, because even after the flood, Abraham and others lived more than 120 years. It's saying, I'm only going to put up with man for 120 years. And then he brings the flood. Okay, now, what's the connection with my spirit won't remain with man? He is flesh, and he's only got 120 years. What's the connection with my spirit won't remain with man? He is flesh, and he's, and he's, he only has 120 years. Here's the connection. When I bring the flood, I'm going to take away my spirit because it's my spirit who's giving life to all flesh on earth. Let me repeat. When I bring the flood, that's when I'm going to remove my spirit from flesh on earth. Because without my spirit, flesh cannot live. My spirit gives biological life to every creature on earth. My spirit sustains all life, animal life, and human life on earth. But when I remove the spirit... Death is inevitable. You with me there? 
You with me there? You understand what he's saying? Folks, let me ask you a question. In the flood, did God only destroy, did God only destroy humans or even animals and birds in the flood? Did God only destroy? Okay. In the ark, did God only save humans or also humans, animals, and birds? In the ark, did God only save humans or humans, animals, and birds? Okay, good. Good. Now you're going to see the point. Genesis 6, 17. Genesis 6, 17. Catch it. Genesis 6, 17. Read. Guys, read. And behold, even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Bam. See? All flesh, animals, humans that have the breath of life in them, I'm going to destroy. Wait. Even animals that are flesh have the breath of life in them? <whistles> Genesis 6, 17. One more time. Read it. I don't know if you caught it. It's not they don't have a spirit, Scott Weldon. They're sustained differently by the Holy Spirit in that they don't need to breathe oxygen, but still they need to be able to live in the waters, and it's the Holy Spirit who sustains them in the waters. But read Genesis 6, 17. Remember I said when the flood came, it destroyed all flesh on earth, right? Human flesh, animal flesh, and even the flesh of birds. Can I read? 6, 17. Behold, even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, not just humans, all flesh on earth. Wherein is the breath of life? Wait, God, you're saying even the beasts have the breath of life? Not just humans? Yes, all flesh on earth has the breath of life or they couldn't live. So I'm going to destroy all flesh on earth that has the breath of life. So, guys, did you see it? Animals who were destroyed by the flood, who are flesh on the earth, with humans, have the breath of life. Genesis 7, 15. Genesis 7, 15. I'm almost done. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two of two. Who went in two and two? Animals, right? Two and two in pairs of all flesh wherein is the breath of life. Bam! End of story. The only ones who went in as pairs, two by two, were the animals, the birds. And yet it says, those who went in two by two of all flesh, they have the breath of life in them. Do you see it or no? Do you see it or no? Read Genesis 7. The only one, the only ones that went in in pairs, two by two, were the animals and the birds. But wait, it says those who went in two and two have the breath of life in them. The breath of life, the same breath of life that Adam had in him. Yes. That breath of life that God breathed in his nostrils, they had it too. Yes. So you mean animals, birds, humans, all have the breath of life, breathe in them? Yes. Which is why they're living souls? Yes. So who told you animals don't have souls? Animals are not soulish. Finally, Raphael, that's interesting you mentioned that because I'm going to explain it. I'm going to explain what it means in a minute. Thank you for that question. Raphael, let me explain it. Finally, Genesis 7.22. But now I'm going to give you the Hebrew interlinear 7.22, but we're going to look at two translations, the King James and New American Standard Bible. And I also believe the English Standard Version translates it the same way. Okay. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, all of that was in the dry land died. So the animals died, the birds died, the humans died that had the breath of life in them, right? 
So do you see, in all these cases, animals, birds, and humans have the breath of life in them? Animals, birds, and humans are living souls. Did you see that? You guys see it? Radical, why are you using two different terms that mean the same thing? Because Zoe and bias are synonymous. Zoe means life and bias would mean life. They can have specific nuances of meaning, but they can also be used synonymously. Okay. Okay, okay now. No, Zoe in Greek means life. Zoe in Greek means life. Okay, now click on that. Guys, click on Genesis 17, 22. Here's what you're going to read. It doesn't say breath of life. It says nishmat ruach chayim. Nishmat ruach chayim. Click on the link. Nishmat ruach chayim. New American Standard Bible translates the Hebrew phrase. It doesn't say breath of life. Breath of life is nishmat chayim. The phrase is nishmat ruach chayim. You know what that means? The breath of the spirit of life. And Raphael, this is going to answer your question. If you click on this, don't take my word for it. There you're going to see it says nishmat breath ruach chayim. The breath of the spirit of life. Post New American Standard Bible. New American Standard Bible. So I can explain and answer the question. New American Standard Bible. Watch here. Here is the link. Click on it. New American Standard Bible. It captures the Hebrew perfectly. Watch here. Just waiting for him to post, and I'm done. I made the case. I made the case. New American Standard Bible. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. Bam. That's what the Hebrew says. Nishmat breath, ruach spirit, chayim, life. But did you catch it? All the animals, the birds, and humans had in their nostrils the breath of the spirit of life. You know what that means? You know what that means? The breath in your nostrils that make you makes us a living soul. Living souls, animate souls, is from the Holy Spirit of life. What this phrase indicates is the same Holy Spirit who gives breath to our bodies makes us living souls, animate beings with souls, is the same Holy Spirit who also gives breath to animals and birds, making them living souls, animate beings who are alive. When the Holy Spirit leaves, their breath leaves and they die. Meaning it's the Holy Spirit who's giving life to animals, to birds, and to us. The breath they breathe, the souls they have to make them animate beings, living beings, is from the Holy Spirit. That's why God said, when I take my spirit away from them, their days are only 120 years. Meaning, when God tells the Holy Spirit, take the life that you've given them out of them so they can die, the Holy Spirit says, you die. You catch it? You understand what it means? The breath that the Spirit gives them, because the Spirit is the one who gives life. The Holy Spirit of God gives life to humans, animates their bodies, making them living souls. And he does the same for animals and birds. He, he gives them breath, animates their bodies, makes them living souls. And it's the Holy Spirit who says, time to give up that breath, time to give up your soul, time for you to die. You could not be born and conceived apart from the Holy Spirit, Irene. Do you catch it? Raphael, even when you say dwell in, you're using a term 
and you're not de defining it. Since Holy Spirit is not a physical substance like water that you put in a cup, when you tell me the Holy Spirit is in an atheist, the Holy Spirit is not even in you spatially, substantially, because he's not a substance. So what do you mean in you? You can't just throw terms and not define the terms. What do you mean in you, the Holy Spirit in you? Define your terms so I can answer you. Sonny, the Holy Spirit gives biological life to all creation, but spiritual life he gives only to believers. That's the distinction. Believers are those who receive spiritual life. Their inner man who died is now alive, whereas the Holy Spirit gives biological life to all creatures. That's the distinction. Biological life and spiritual life. Spiritual life is only given to believers who turn to Christ by the Holy Spirit, whereas biological life is something the Spirit gives to all creatures. Otherwise, they can't live. See the difference? So to answer Raphael's question, the Holy Spirit is in an atheist in that the Holy Spirit is giving physical life to that atheist, giving physical breath to that atheist, <clears throat> sustaining the brain activity of that atheist, the heartbeat of that atheist, the blood circulation of that atheist is all sustained by the Holy Spirit. But what the Holy Spirit is not doing is giving spiritual life to that atheist. He's giving physical life to that atheist. Exactly, Roscoe. Beautiful, Roscoe. Father, Son, Holy Spirit together give physical life to all creation, sustains all creation. But Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three together, only give spiritual life to believers united to Christ. Is that clear? So have I established two things? Number one, animals and birds are living souls who have the breath of life in their nostrils. They're soulish creatures. They have souls. Have we established that? Number two, have we established that even animals need redeeming, redemption by the blood of Christ because the animal kingdom, the plant life, everything has been corrupted, tainted, polluted by sin and needs to be restored. Yes, Susan Baker, you got it. Is that clear? So, Raphael, now notice how you're going to contradict yourself. If the Holy Spirit is not in the atheist, then he's not omnipresent because omnipresent means present everywhere. But the moment you tell me he's not in the atheist, you just said he's not present everywhere. Notice your contradiction because you're not defining the terms properly. You're not understanding Paul's use of the preposition correctly. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. If the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, he's in everything and everyone, even the atheist. But if he's not in the atheist, then he's not omnipresent. You see, you're not defining these terms. And you're going to confuse yourself. Yeah, and you're not going to be an atheist for long, Andrew, because the Holy Spirit's going to give you spiritual life in Jesus' name. You just know too much, and you keep coming back for more. Because your heart aches for Jesus, and whether you like it or not, you're in love with Jesus still. Okay, is that clear now? If I've made my case, well, Scott, that cat is a soulish being, a living soul animated by the Spirit. So now to answer the question, if they have souls that leave their bodies, does that mean they're alive in heaven? And that mean will they be resurrected? Let me... Answer clearly, I don't know. I'm not saying they won't be in heaven and they won't be resurrected, and I'm not saying they will. The Bible doesn't tell me. That doesn't mean because it doesn't happen. It means that the Bible is more focused about you and your resurrection than animals, but 
I won't be surprised. Listen to me. I won't be surprised that the God who created these animals with the desire to want to live forever and not die is the same God who has their souls preserved in his presence and will then resurrect them again. I won't be shocked. You get my point? So where the Bible is silent, I have to be silent. It doesn't come out and say when the souls of the animals leave, they're alive in conscience somewhere, either with God or in punishment. It doesn't say that, right? And it doesn't say that their bodies will then be resurrected, but it doesn't deny it because God is focused on humans and their resurrection and where they go when they die. So when the Bible is silent, you be silent. When the Bible is silent, you be silent. And so don't be surprised and don't be shocked that if you're in heaven, your dog Spike is there and runs up to you and starts licking you again. Don't be surprised. All right? And don't let any teacher tell you otherwise. Tell them chapter and verse. The Bible is silent. You shut up. Don't speak where the Bible doesn't speak. And don't be surprised if they're going to be there. You want me there? No, it doesn't say it goes down. You misread it. Terrestrial, you misread. No, it didn't say that. Terrestrial fan, you misread Ecclesiastes. He's asking a question. Do you know whether it goes down and the spirits of man go up? He's asking a question that under the sun, just on human observation, apart from God revealing it to you, can you tell me whether the spirit of a man goes up and the spirit of an animal goes down? Let's look at that since you mentioned it. Oh, boy. Man, I'm not going to finish today. All right. Ecclesiastes 3, 19 to 20. Ecclesiastes 3, 19 to 20. Yeah, I'm not going to finish today. Okay, let's read Ecclesiastes 3, 19 to 20. For that which befalleth the Son of Man befalleth beasts. Notice what he's saying. Guys, read this. Read, please. Read this. Solomon is writing a book showing you the futility of human wisdom. Wisdom that you gain from human observation, human experience, from daily life, apart from revelation. He's going, look, if all you have is just human experience, human observation, then the world is very bleak and depressing. So then he asks, he's talking to someone, apart from revelation from God, can you answer this question? Because from the looks of it, humans and animals share the same fate, so humans are no better than animals because they both die. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. They all share the same feet, fate because as the one dieth, so dieth the other. We all die. So why is it better for me to be a human being and not a dog? Yea, they have all one breath. Now here again is where you're not going to see it. You know what the word breath is? Let me give you the Hebrew again. Here you go. It's not breath. It's ruach. We all have the same spirit. What he means is the same spirit animates us. You don't believe me? Click on it. It's ruach. Go there. The same spirit animates humans and animals. Ruach. Go ahead. The same Holy Spirit, I take it as a reference to the spirit that animates us, not to our individual spirit, okay? Go there and see, All right? Hold on. Did I give you? Yeah. Waruach. You see it? It's waruach. Do you see it? It's ruach. It's not breath. It's spirit. You catch it? Let's read Ecclesiastes 3.19 again. I just explained, Mike, downtown, what it means to have the Holy Spirit. If you just came in lately and you're mocking, you're going to get blocked. I just explained, the Bible says it's the Holy Spirit who gives animals, birds, and human beings biological life. All biological life is from the Spirit who sustains all life, animals, birds, marine life, and humans. Don't be a smart aspiration. 
Ecclesiastes 3.19. Read with me. For that which befalleth the sons of... Yes, I will raise my voice, and you're not going to do anything about it. You're going to shut up and take it. Okay? Anyway, Ecclesiastes 3.19. For that which befalleth the sons of men, befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one spirit, so that a man hath no preeminence over a beast for all his vanity. Now, guys, understand what he just said here. Understand what he just said here. Apart from God's revelation to man, all you have is human experience, human observation. Are human beings really better than animals? When we both die and some animals live better than humans? So can you tell me, without God revealing it to you, humans have an advantage over animals? Or is this life simply vanity? Waste. You know, a complete waste. Because humans and animals both die, both have the same fate, and at certain time, certain animals have it better than humans. So what advantage is there of being a human over against an animal? You understand what he's saying? You understand his point? Isn't that true? You got some animals who live large. Animals who live in mansions because their owners are rich. Animals who get pedic pedicures, manicures, right? Shampoo, bathed with, with the most expensive of ingredients, right? Decked out. And then you have human beings living in the streets, living worse than dogs. Right? Now, Ecclesiastes 3, 20 to 21. Ecclesiastes 3, 20 to 21. Ecclesiastes 3, 20 to 21. Watch here. All go unto one place. All are of the dust. See, we return to dust. And all turn to dust again. Now he asks the question. Guys, pay attention. Now he asks the question. Who knoweth? Who knows? Whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes downward to the earth. Do you know that for a fact? But notice what this assumes. Animals have spirits that leave their bodies when they return to the dust. Bam. So he's not denying that animals have spirits. He's asking the question. When the spirit of an animal leaves the animal, does it go down? And when the spirit of the human being leaves the human being, does it go up? Can you answer? Do you know? Now understand what this means, folks. Just like humans have spirits, so do animals. They have ruach. And why do animals die? The same reason humans do, because their spirit leaves their body. So when the spirit of a dog leaves the dog, the soul of the dog leaves the dog, the dog dies. But then he asks the question, where does the spirit go of that animal? Where does the spirit of the man goes? Apart from Jesus revealing the answer, you don't have an answer. So he's asking, can you, oh man, apart from revelation, tell me for certain when the soul and spirit of an animal leaves, it goes down. And the soul and spirit of the human being, when it leaves, it goes up. Can you answer that question? No, I can't. I don't know. But then guess what he does at the end? Now he concludes everything. And then he says, let me tell you the true meaning of life. That's Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. He then says, remember your creators in your youth before your eyes dim and your candle, <clears throat> right? Waxes out. Remember your creator, because here's what's going to happen to you. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Now he's going to give you God's perspective, God's revelation. He ends it with God's perspective, God's revelation. Watch here. Watch here. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. 
Here you go. Then shall the dust return to the earth. Now he's making a statement, not asking a question. Your body from the dust returns, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Oh, man, now let me tell you what God says. Your body returns to the dust, and your spirit will return to him. But did you notice he never answered the question about where the spirit of an animal goes? He left that silent. Did you notice that? You notice? He now tells you, God has made known. Your body returns to the dust and your spirit returns to him who gave it. But he did not answer the question about animals. He's talking about humans now. He left that silent. He left that silent. So if he left it silent, how dare you tell me whether the spirits of animals are wiped out and no longer continue to exist in some form somewhere? By what authority can you tell me that if God has been silent? You get it? And so he concludes his book. Ecclesiastes 12, 12 to 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 12 to 14. And not, notice how he concludes. And I'm going to conclude with it. I'm going to conclude with it. Ecclesiastes 12, 12 to 14. Watch. And further, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there's no end. You will never stop writing. And a much study is awareness of the flesh. And if you study too much, you'll get tired, you'll get depressed, you'll be weary. So let me now put it into perspective. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here is the conclusion of my <clears throat> research, my observation, my experience of the world. Here it is. <clears throat> Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every th secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Mark Cyril, I just decimated and destroyed your lie. Animals have spirits and souls. You don't like it? Take a hike. They even have the breath of life in them. Don't come here. Johnny, come lately and pontificate because I'm going to make you look stupid. Okay. He's one of these idiots that I told you. He thinks he knows scripture. He doesn't. So I'm going to treat him like a... In fact, I don't want to insult dogs. Dogs have souls and spirits. He's worse than a dog. Right? Do you catch it? You see what he said? You caught what he said, right? Writing never ends. Studying will get you tired, confused. But here's the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. Because God is going to call you and count for everything you've done. That's the conclusion. Okay? Andrew, it's okay, man. Like I said, I can get dirty with the worst of them and stoop to their level. And if they're going to be jerks and pontificate and know-it-alls, I'm going to embarrass them. Right? Because... That's one of my issues. And until God delivers me, I'm going to give you a taste of your medicine, which is what I'm going to do to James White, God willing, in Detroit, in Jesus' name. Everything good? Everything clear? The Bible proves two things. One, one, animals, birds, are living souls, have the breath of life in them. They have souls. They have spirits. Two, Jesus died to reconcile, redeem, restore Every cre part of creation, even animals, because even animals have been affected, tainted, polluted, and corrupted by sin. What an amazing God we serve. What an amazing book he's given us. This Bible is his word. It is the voice of God preserved by the Spirit so we can know the true God, fall in love with him, and have the assurance he loves us, and we will live with him forever. Amen? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. 
Jesus Christ, you are Jehovah in the flesh to the glory of God the Father. Wash us in your blood. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and be patient with us and save us, Lord Jesus. Fill us with your spirit to know you and love you, to cling to you. Bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters and love them, Lord Jesus, and provide for us. And give me the grace to be holy for your glory and the health I need to serve you. And bless us all. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord, the Father's beloved, his very heart, his son in the flesh. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, pray for me. Pray for traveling safety. I'm traveling to Arizona tomorrow, God willing, and I'll be there till Monday. And then I fly out, God willing, Tuesday back to Chicago. But pray God will release me from my trial there. Pray God will protect my daughters and bring them to me and pray the Lord provide and pray he releases me in October by his grace. I'm leaving to another state, starting a new chapter in my life. Pray and pray God convicts their mother to repent and fear Jesus to be saved before it's too late for her. I love you guys. I hope you're blessed. Yes, this weekend I'll be in the Phoenix area. So if you're there, contact me. I'd love to meet you. I hope you're blessed. Al Darish, I hope you're blessed too and you loved it and it blew you away. How amazing God is, how amazing this book is. And Christ is alive. He's real. Because he lives, we will live also. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Take care.